uh, probably I can get started. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Yifei Mo um, uh, from University of Maryland, uh, Department of Material Science and Engineering. Um, Dr. Mo obtained his PhD degree uh, from uh, Department of Material Science, University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2008, and then he moved to MIT uh, working with uh, uh, Gerband uh, uh, Seder. Uh, in 2013, uh, he joined University, University of Maryland, um, Department of Material Science and Engineering. And uh, a couple of months ago, I had a really nice discussion with uh, Dr. Ma. I think his research really uh, showcased the power of uh, computational material by design, particularly uh, high throughput computing and data-driven approach that help us to better understand uh, battery materials and to um, extract useful uh, design principles to design uh, better uh, uh, batteries. So with no further ado, I will have our speaker start the presentation. Okay, hello, anybody here? Okay, hi, thank you uh, everyone for coming and I thank you uh, Xi for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Okay, so uh, <coughs> I'm at the University of Maryland, so it's quite uh, close by, right? College Park, you know, so it's a really great pleasure like I can visit Carnegie Institute today. Uh, so I think uh, uh, she already kind of tell you uh, what I'm going to do, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm going to particularly talk about some of the recent work, you know, how use computation techniques, right, to design materials and also interfaces, right, which you also know is very, very important for a lot of devices and materials application, right, with the emphasizing uh, solid state battery, which is the next generation uh, battery people propose for lithium ion battery. So here, just uh, a little bit of history. Uh, you know, of uh, materials design, right? So we all know that our society are heavily rely on certain materials, right? For example, here is something like Teflon, right? Titanium, right? You know, uh, semiconductors. So if you look back history, you know, any of this material actually takes about, on average, uh, 20 years, right? From the time of invention, you know, to the time of commercialization. So this is a very, very long time. So for example, the lithium ion battery, right? A battery technology we rely on our daily day life so much, actually already very well demonstrated in a lab, right, by Stan Whittingham in the 70s, but the commercial realization really comes in by Sony in the 90s. Okay, so this is a really long time. So, you know, as a dream, right, of all our material science and engineers, what we want is really to shorten this time, right? To, you know, to really bring this materials innovation, right, to commercialization faster. So this is uh, what the uh, ex-President Obama right, uh, proposed the Materials Genome Initiative to design materials twice as fast. Right? For example, uh, you know, uh, things like silicon circuit, right, lithium battery, right, we all know it takes a long time, so how can we do that faster? So what I'm going to show you today right, is actually how we can use computational techniques, right, especially those based on first principles, you know, to accelerate materials design using the example of solid state uh, lithium batteries. So for those of you uh, who don't know much about battery, I just give you a quick background so of how lithium battery works. So this is kind of like a schematic diagram, right? So on the left here is the anode, okay, which is usually made of graphite. So you can see, you know, this layer structure. And the cathode usually is a lithium transition metal oxide, right, such as lithium cobalt oxide. And in the middle, this is the electrolyte. So what happens during this charging of the battery is that you can see lithium sort of move out from the graphite layers, right, and they insert it into uh, this, uh, 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 you know, uh, transition metal oxide layers, right? This is called the intercalation reaction. And uh, you can see that in the meanwhile, right, the electron, right, which is blocked by the electrolyte that goes to the external circuit, so you can harness that uh, reaction energy, right? So basically during the charging of the battery, this process is exactly opposite, right? So what happens is that, sorry, you apply a voltage, okay, right? Then basically this seems sort of deintercalate, right? Move out of this transition metal oxide and insert it back into this graphite, right? And you can see that, uh, you know, uh, this is returned to the state of the charged battery, okay? So this is generally how it works, right? So now there are a lot of research going on in lithium battery. Right, and most of them are focused on this electrode material, right? For example, you know, how you improve the anode here, right, or the cathode here, so you can store more lithium and more energy. 
right? And uh, it's often kind of overlooked is what's in the middle here, what's, which is very uh, important, right? So this is, you know, does not actually really give you any active energy, right? This electrolyte, and it's often made of uh, lithium salt and some organic solvent, right? Kind of look like this. But now it's really become a big problem right now because all these kind of uh, organic solvents used here, right, such as acylene carbonate, you know, things like that, they are highly flammable, okay? So which lead to the safety issue of the lithium battery, right? So you know, you know, Sansom, right, like S7, okay, right, also Dreamliner and electro vehicles. That's because you have like a highly flammable component in your battery, right, so that's one thing. And another thing that is that this electrolyte actually also limits your energy density of your battery. The reason is that, you know, you have to have some electrode that's compatible with electrolyte, right? So that's actually greatly limit your choice of electrode. And also because uh, this electrode usually have a limited voltage window, you know, about like four volt. So actually that's also limit the vo voltage you can have in your battery, right? So you overall leave your energy density of your battery. Uh, so a solution that actually, you know, people propose you know, for the next generation battery, right, is actually really replace this, you know, organic electrolyte in the middle uh, into the ceramic solid electrolyte, right? So in a sense to really resolve these two great challenges of electrolyte. Uh, so the, the, the advantage of u really using a ceramic solid, right, is that first of all, many of ceramics are intrinsically non-flammable, okay? So you may have improved safety. And also uh, people are, trying to do is that use this to enable U electro material, such as, for example, lithium metal anode, right? Because lithium metal, as you know, actually pack lithium, right, in a highly dense way. So that can significantly increase the energy density. On the other side, people also try to use high voltage cast material, right, to go beyond like the four volt we have today, right? This also increases energy density. So these are the promises of solid state, uh, uh, you know, lithium battery. But then it really comes this great materials challenge, right? You know, if you replace this electrolyte into a solid, so the first problem you, you uh, need to solve is that you want to have a material that transport lithium ion, right, as fast as an electrolyte as usual, right? You know, because if you don't, as I showed you, right, in the animation, if you don't transport lithium ion faster, right, you will not get the energy, or if you transport them too slow, right, you will just get too low of a power. And a sec so that's actually, you that one of the problem, right, you need a good material that's a good lithium ionic conductor to serve as solid electrolyte. And the second thing is that the lithium ion actually also have to cross this interface here. And usually, usually, you know, when you actually put these solids together, you know, they're actually bad for transport, you know. So that's actually uh, also a big issue because it gives you uh, high interfacial resistance, you know, and it gives you low uh, power density for your battery. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today uh, you know, it's really, you know, using computation technique, right, to, to, you know, to show you how we can understand, you know, these problems here and then how we can then still, right, use computation to actually design new materials, right, with a better solid electrolyte and also better <coughs> interfacial transport, okay? Uh, okay, so just a little bit of background about this new battery technology. So uh, this field really uh, uh, takes off uh, about this paper. Uh, you know, by Toyota and the uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Okay, so this is a Nature Material in 2011. So what they find is actually a big breakthrough. What they find is actually actually find a new, brand new material, and this is the composition. Okay, right, it's a lithium germanium a P2S12, right, LGPS, often short for. So its crystal structure looks like this, right? So it's actually a completely new crystal structure. And if you look at that, right, so basically this is, uh, you see this, uh, uh, you know, kind of blue-purple uh, tetra tetragonal, right? So that's our, uh, the PS4, right, or Gemini S4. And these green guys here, right, are actually the lithium. So you can see that actually, uh, you know, lithium kind of organized this way. So this is a top view of the crystal structure, right? So you can see lithium actually aligned, right, in this kind of like one-line channel there, okay? So what's actually, so unique and great about this uh, new material structure is that they actually can transport lithium ion very, very fast. So this is actually the uh, ionic conductivity of this material. It's about 12 millisiemens per centimeter at room temperature. So that's actually comparable, right, to those liquid electrolyte currently used in lithium battery, right? Um, 
And uh, Toyota really demonstrated that they can actually make a solid state battery with that, right, and show great performance, right? They actually even put in a uh, uh, you know, scooter that's actually back then, right? Now they try to scale up for electric cars. Uh, so they really demonstrated right, improved safety, right, high energy density, long cycle life, actually even higher charging rate, right? And uh, the battery that are able to operate as really high and really low temperature. So this is actually a really new promising technology. As you can see, really enabled by this very unique and noble, right, fast ion conductor materials. <coughs> so, you know, so uh, our work actually also started back then. So what we did is we tried to look at this new material, right, it's so groundbreaking, but there comes some critical problem with that, right? So first of all, it has germanium. So uh, as many of you may know that germanium is actually very, very expensive, okay? And uh, like world production is only like tens of tons, okay? So that's basically a no-go for large-scale application, for example, in electrical vehicles, okay? And second of all, these materials are based on the sulfur chemistry. So uh, especially this is a CO phosphate, right? Like a PAS chemistry. So this chemistry is actually very, very reactive in the air, right? It actually reacts with air and water crazily. So this is actually also a bad news because it significantly increases your manufacturing cost. Uh, so what we're trying to do is that we, you know, we think like how we can address these two problems for this new material, especially whether we can com come up with a new material, right, that still conduct lithium as fast, right, but can address these two problems, especially using computation, so we can do that before synthesis, because as you know, uh, all these complex materials are very difficult to synthesize. So what we think is that, right, whether we can replace this into this uh, other kind of ge storage geometry, right? For example, whether we can replace sulfur into oxygen, or we can replace this expensive germanium into cheaper silicon and a tin. Uh, so what we did, right, is we first want to see whether this material, right, can be made, right? Whether they really stable phase. And this actually, we can really do that, right, on computation, okay, based on this materials database that's already enabled by, you know, this materials genome initiative. So what we do, right, essentially is that we actually get all these, all the compounds, right, in this system, okay, right, and these, all, each of them, right, have a calculated energy, right, and then we basically compare the convex hull, okay, and then we can get the phase diagram, right, so this is a quaternary phase diagram, okay, right. So then what we do is that with the new material, we can just calculate the energy of that new material, okay, and sort of, you know, put it in this phase diagram, right, and evaluate this relative energy to other phases, okay? And this would actually give us the relative stability of this new material, for example, LGPS, right, respect to other stable phases, right, in the phase diagram. Um, and here we, you know, we find that LGPS actually is slightly metal stable, okay? Uh, and this decomposition energy is actually fairly low. It's about like 15 MeV per atom, right? And it's actually li like to decompose into these two phases, right? Lithium CO phosphate uh, and li lithium germanium S4, right? So both are actually fairly well-known phases, okay? So then with this capability, we can actually evalu evaluate this decomposition energy of these other, you know, newly proposed phases because this decomposition energy actually give us, a, you know, sort of a quantity, right, to describe the phase stability of the material. Right, so you can see this is a different combination of different cation and ion, right? So the LGP is here, right, the germanium and sulfur. So this is the 15, is the decomposition energy. And what we find that is that if you change germanium into silicon or tin, okay, the decomposition energy is actually fairly close, right? You know, so which probably means that if you can synthesize LGPS, it's a good chance that you can synthesize the silicon substituted one or the tin substituted one, okay? But if we replace sulfur into oxygen, right, still in a you know, very similar crystal structure, we find that uh, the decomposition energy increased significantly, okay, almost to like 90 MeV per atom. So this is actually a fairly high energy, right? So we think that this oxygen substituted compound are, are likely not stable, okay? So from this, you know, very simple calculation, right, we get that, you know, if you, uh, some good news, right, which is you can replace this germanium, right, likely to be silicon tin, but for the sulfur one, right, you're probably not gonna get the uh, oxide version of the LGPS, right, because they're probably highly thermodynamic and unstable, right? Uh, okay, so that's about the stability of this new material, right? Then another thing we want to know is that whether, you know, this material can conduct lithium, right, really as fast as that we want it. 
So, uh, so to do that, we had developed this, uh, you know, ab initio molecular dynamics techniques to simulate the lithium diffusion in this material. Okay, so we start with the LGPS with the testing, right? So the benefits of doing ab initio molecular dynamics, right, is that, as you know, like, you know, usually MD use some empirical force field, right? To do it uh, through uh, ab initio, then you don't need to worry about, you know, empirical fitting, okay, right? You, you know, this is actually very critical if you want to design new materials. And also another thing you do in MD is that, right, you just actually let the, uh, you know, lithium sort of move in the material. So you actually don't need to assume any lithium diffusion mechanism. You know, the simulation will actually get it for you. Uh, so here shows our uh, AB initial MD simulation results. Okay, and as you can see, right, this is the activation energy we get. Right, and this is from the experimental measurement, and this is the conductivity we get, and this is from the experimental, earlier experiment measurement. As you can see, right, you know, this is a agree very, very well, right? And, uh, and again, right, this actually include like no empirical fitting at all, right? So this is actually all, all, all from DFT. Okay, so then what we did is we actually also calculate this newly predicted material, right? For example, the silicon and a tin substitute version of this material. And this is the Arrhenius plot, right? It's basically the diffusivity, log diffusivity over one over T. And here's our uh, computation results showing below. And as you can see, right, here is actually a good news, right? Is that, you know, uh, you not only can make the silicon tin, and probably they also will still have this fast lithium conductivity as you wanted, right? So this is the original LGPS, and you can see, right, for both silicon and tin substitute version, okay, they are actually almost as fast as the original ALGPS, okay? Uh, right, so this is actually our computation prediction, right? So then the question is right, whether we can, you know, people can really make it in experiments, right, in real physical lab. So these predictions are confirmed by multiple research groups over the world, right, after the computation. Uh, so this is a paper by Kohn from Max Planck Institute. Right, so actually they, they synthesize, you know, original ALGPS and also the silicon and tin substitute version, right? And you can see, you know, they show very similar results, right, as what we uh, get in the AB initial MD simulation. And this is another Germany group. Uh, they did the uh, tin substitute version, and you can see the bulk conductivity they got is seven millisiemens per centimeter, and our computation prediction is six, okay? So this is actually really demonstrate, you know, the, the, the capability, right, of the computation, right, to predict new materials and their uh, property. And this is uh, another uh, experimental work uh, by Toyota, uh, you know, the same group. Uh, and they, uh, this has just uh, come out 2016 on Nature Energy. So what they did is actually they also successfully make the silicon uh, substitute version, right, of the LGPS. Uh, but they add a little bit of the uh, uh, chlorium, okay? And uh, so basically they demonstrate the solid electron material that's even better than LGPS, right? And also without the expensive germanium. So if you see their results here, right, they actually get an ionic conductivity of 25, and our ab initial MD predicts 23, okay? So this is also, you know, uh, uh, another confirmation, right? And they actually made a solid state battery with this newer solid, uh, solid electron material, and uh, you can see they actually demonstrate, right, actually very, very high rate. This is the 18 C rate battery, right? 18 C rate. Uh, what it means is that is a C rate is a sort of concept to describe how fast you can charge and discharge, right? For the battery, basically one C is like you can charge and discharge in one hour, right? 18 C means that you can charge and discharge in one eighteenth of an hour, right? So basically, kind of like uh, three three and a half minutes, right? And you can see like you can they can charge the battery that fast and still can hold, you know even over 500 charges, right? So that's actually very, very impressive. Um, okay, right, so this is about uh, uh, what we did, right, in terms of the computation design of materials. Uh, so here, you know, I want to move into some scientific uh, uh, understanding, right? It's actually, you know, why this material can actually have lithium conductivity that is so fast, right? Faster than, you know, most other solid material. So here is kind of like a summary of uh, lithium superionic conductor uh, that are known to human being, okay? So you can see uh, it's actually not many, right? So this is actually the ionic conductivity, right, in the log scale, okay? So you can see the ALGPS is on top here, right? Uh, 
you know, so uh, if you look at all this material, right, you can see that, you know, if you, let's say, if you set your cutoff 10 to minus 3, right, you only have a few material. If you set cutoff at 10 to minus 4, right, you know, you, you, you still don't have that many, right? And most of the material probably way down below here, right, 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 5, or even worse. And if you look at this material, right, you can see it's actually have very diverse chemistry, right? You know, you have sulfur here, sulfide here, right? Some halogen doped sulfide, right? Here's oxide, okay, this is actually a garnet structure. And this is, uh, you know, phosphide, right? Uh, Nasicum structure, nitride, right? Hydride, you know, perovskite, this is a perovskite structure, and also highlight, right? So this is very, very diverse chemistry. Uh, and they actually also have very, very diverse structure, right? So for this first one is actually the LGPS structure, which we showed you before, right? You have this kind of like PS4, uh, you know, polyhedral aligning this way, right? So the, your lithium is aligned along the C channel, okay? And here's a, a, a gerodite structure right here. And then this is actually another uh, very uh, uh, famous group of uh, superionic conductor. This is the lithium garnet. Okay, so you can see this is actually a very complex compound, and you can see the structure is very complex, right? And it actually looks very different from the LGPS compound. And then this is a uh, nasicum, right? Nasicum uh, is also, uh, you know, known from the 70s as a very fast ion conductor, right? So you can see it's also a very different crystal structure framework. Um, so what we are uh, trying to do here is that we try to really understand, like, you know, why, you know, these material structures right, can actually give you very, very fast ionic conductivity, right? What's the fundamental uh, mechanism there, right? If we can understand that, probably that would help to re help us to design better superionic conductors. So here's just something from the textbook. Sorry, the equation uh, doesn't show up properly, right? But basically, you know, it's uh, sigma times Q squared, right? You know, that's the charge you carry, okay? And this is a D N is your carrier concentration, basically how many mobile lithium you have, right? And then this is an exponential term, right, or Runeus term. So you have an activation energy here, right, over KT. Okay, so this is actually what we learn from textbook, right? You have some lithium, you know, in a solid, right? They just kind of like move around, right? This is a thermally activated process. Uh, so to get high on the conductivity, right, one thing you would need is you have this high end, right? Basically high mobile concentration. And in the meanwhile, you also want to have this very low activation energy, right? Essentially, what this activation energy tells you, right, is that when your lithium kind of like moves from one side to another, right, they sort of endure an energy landscape, okay, and this actually gives you activation energy. So to achieve a very high ion conductivity, right, you actually need a very low activation energy, right, because this is associated with the exponential term. Right, if it's low, right, then you can actually get a very high conductivity at room temperature. Uh, <coughs> okay, so you know, so to understand what actually really happens in this superionic conductor, we, you know, we look further into our ab initial molecular dynamic result, right, of this uh, LGPS material, right. So this crystal structure is shown here, and what we find is very interesting. We find that all these lithium, right, when they migrate they actually migrate together. You know, it's kind of like a few lithium, right, kind of like migrate in groups. So you can actually see here, right, this is actually kind of like, a, uh, you know, some like time average uh, AMD results, right? So you can see all these lithium kind of like move together, right, along these C channels here, okay? Um, and we did like some rigorous statistical analysis and we really confirm, you know, this is actually the dominant mechanism for lithium migration in this kind of material. Um, Okay, and we also confirm in the other superionic conductor, right, such as garnet, okay, and AOL0 and nasicum, right, so actually all, in all this material, lithium actually moves in groups, you know, some of them moves uh, all together, right, in kind of like a few picosecond kind of time scale. So the reason is like really why is that, okay? So here we actually try to extract this concerted migration from a initial MD simulation, okay, and we did this, uh, 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 Nagy elastic band calculation to get this barrier, okay? So in LGPS, right, we basically find, oops, we basically find that the, the, the four lithium kind of like move along the channel and you get a very low barrier here, right? And in garnet, okay, it's the same thing. They move like this and you get a barrier of 0.26 CV. And in nasicum, right, it's also two move like this and also you get a low barrier, okay? Um, and here comes the question, right? So if you think like, you know, how, atoms move, right, 
you usually think like when they hop, they get a barrier, right? So if you have a number of them moving, you know, the probably the barrier will be you know higher, right, or at least equal, right? But like, why would that happen? So we also examine the la energy landscape, you know, of this material because we probably expect it's very very flat, right? So the lithium can move easily. Uh, so here's from our calculation, right? So uh, this is for the AL GPS, and we find it's very surprising that the barrier is actually higher than that, okay? And this is in Garnet, right? To move the energy landscape, you get actually get a barrier of 0.6 EV, and in Nasican is about like 0.5 EV, okay? So here comes a very obvious contradiction, right? You know, it's kind of like in the crystal structure, you know, it's actually your barrier to move is actually this high, right? About like 0.5 to 0.6 EV, but when the multiple of them moving together, you actually get a barrier of like 0.2 and 0.3 EV. Okay, so why would that happen? And we think this is probably one of the critical reasons, you know, why this material can conduct lithium so fast, right? You know, because if we can understand it, probably that can help, you know, help us get the, solve the mystery of fast ion conduction. So to understand this, we actually build a very, very simple diffusion model. Okay, we basically get the energy scape like this. So this is uh, have a barrier about 0.6 EV, right? So it's kind of like very similar from what we calculate on bottom of here. And then what we did is we put multiple lithium in it, right? Because there are multiple lithium ion moving, okay? And we also give it kind of like a realistic occupancy, okay? So you can see there are lithium located here and also some lithium located up there. And the reason is that is actually, that's what exactly you have in the real material here, right? For example, you can see in garnet here, right? So they move here, right? That's the barrier, okay? So this is a tetrahedral side and this is octahedral side, okay? As you can see above here, this octahedral side is actually occupied, okay? The same thing goes in the nasicum, right? When this lithium move here to here, right? You know, it goes here to here, right? So this is also a side and it's also occupied, okay? So we basically give it a more realistic site occupancy. And because as you know, lithium are ions, right? It actually carries one charge, so actually they also you know, interact strongly. So we also add Coulomb interaction along that, okay? So once we get that, and we, then we calculate the barrier of this lithium ion moving, we actually find this very interesting, right? So they move like this, oops, sorry. Right, and the barrier is actually as low as about 0.3 EV, okay, right? So it's actually, lower than the, you know, the original barrier of the landscape, okay? And what I, why, why this would happen exactly because, you know, when this lithium kind of move right up hill, right, they climb the barrier, but in the meanwhile, there's one lithium kind of move down, right? So they move down, they basically sort of like doing this concerted migration, they cancel part of the migration barrier that you would get. Okay, so uh, as an overall effect, when they move together, okay, they actually give you a lower barrier. Okay, so that's actually why, you know, uh, we think we sort of understand why the lithium, right, can move so fast in this superionic conduct structure, right? So on the left, where we show like what happens t in typical solids, right, you basically have one lithium ion moving, right, and then it's get over your barrier. But in the lithium superionic conductor, because you have uh, lithium occupy the high energy side, so they may move concertedly, okay, right? So there's one kind of like help you pushing, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, right, to, to get you some boost, right? So actually that gives you a low energy barrier, okay? So, right, so here actually we think through this understanding, right, we sort of explain, you know, why concerted migration can move so fast in this super, super ionic conductor. Or we think we, from here, we also get a simple design principle, right? of how to, you know, how you can design your material to make the ion move faster. So what you can do is actually, you know, insert a lithium ion, right, on the, you know, on this high energy side, right? Once you insert that, they, you can probably activate this, you know, concerted migration mechanism, okay? Uh, so here is what we uh, really did in our computation. So, you know, we actually use some, like, high support uh, algorithm to actually, right, go through all these known inorganic materials, right? So here's one of the compounds we uncovered, right? So there's actually a, a number of other criteria you have to met, right? So this is one example. So this, this is a lithium tantalum silicate, and this material has never been studied for lithium conduction before, okay? Uh, so its structure kind of looks like this. So when the material is not doped, 
you know, the, it actually have a fairly high activation energy, right, and low diffus diffusivity. So, and what we did is we actually doped this material, right, we sort of alien and doped on the tetanum side, right, by the conium, right, then you can actually insert more lysium in the structure. Uh, so in this structure, actually, they are, there are two extra sides the lysium can go into. Actually, one is between these two guys, and the other is between these two guys. You know, there's actually some empty space there, right? So once you add more lithium, it actually goes to those sides, and that, is, that actually is a high energy side, okay? And then we did the ab initial MD simulation on this new material, and what we find is that, right, once you actually add this lithium into the high energy side, the activation energy drops significantly. Okay, and this actually have a very, very high lithium ion conductivity of about like four millisiemens per centimeter, right? That's actually comparable to the best of uh, oxide-based, you know, superionic conductor out there, right? So for, through this, we actually really indeed demonstrate, right, how we can, you know, through computation, get some new novel insight, right? And then how we can apply this, right, into design strategy and actually, you know, really discover and design a new, uh, new material. Okay, uh, so is there any questions so far? Like, uh, yeah? So, so you mean that you actually share all the pieces of that information? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, it's actually highly an anisotropic. Uh, yeah, actually, we, in one of the paper, we kind of, uh, you know, uh, right, explain it in detail. It's highly anisotropic, right? So basically, they diffuse mass faster along this C, C channel, okay? But uh, um, on the AB direction, there are also some diffusion, as you can see, but it's actually much, much slower. You know, it's actually have high activation energy, right? Actually yeah, it would be, no, it would be difficult, like for real world application to use a single crystal. So yeah, it's actually polycrystal, right? So, uh, right, so actually ideally people prefer uh, 3D conductor, right, you know, but this material is 1D. Actually, people also find that when they, uh, in the silicon one, uh, that we sh showed the diffusion on the other direction is much more enhanced, actually. So it's actually also the bad, uh, good news, actually. Okay, great. Oops, sorry. Okay, maybe we can get into more detailed question a little later. Uh, um, oops, sorry. Uh, okay, so here I'm gonna, uh, you know, move into the second part of my talk, right, which is uh, kind of the interface, uh, you know, between the electrolyte and the electro material, right? So uh, as I mentioned before, right, so I think, you know, uh, right now in, in our commercial battery, the anode material used is graphite, okay? Uh, and uh, it's actually, uh, this material actually, you know, it's actually uh, uh, does not pack lithium very dense, right? It's actually take about like, you know, almost near half of the volume in your battery, right? So, you know, what people kind of thinking now is actually really replace it uh, into a lithium metal, right? Because lithium metal, as you can see, pack lithium in a very, very dense form, right? So through this, you can actually significantly boost your energy density of lithium battery. Uh, so this is actually the, you know, kind of like a top priority uh, direction in the Department of Energy right now. Uh, but then it actually comes uh, with a significant drawback, right? So first of all, as you know, lithium metal is very, very reducing, right? They probably is so reducing, they just reduce anything getting in contact with it. And another problem is that, you know, when you actually charge your battery, right, when you put lithium back, you know, when you charge it, they don't actually deposit nicely into the packed way. They actually grow some dendrite, you know, and those dendrite, right, kind of like, you know, pierce through the battery and eventually short your battery, okay? So that's kind of like biggest problem of this new anode technology. Um, <coughs> uh, here, what we are actually very interested in is that, right, when you actually really put this solid electron material together, right, what will actually happens at the interface, right? You know, whether we'll, Will this solid material actually just get along with each other, right? Or they will actually slowly degrade over time, or they may react and form something at the interface, okay? And this would be very important because if you form something else there, right, you probably want to know that and probably want to probably engineer that, okay? Because otherwise, it would give you, you know, for example, all the problems, right? Such as high interfacial resistance, 
or you know, or poor cycle life or columbic efficiency feel better. Uh, so here what we try to do is we really try to use computation techniques to understand that better. Uh, so how we understand that is that we can still do that through a thermodynamic scheme, okay, at first. Uh, so here's kind of like a schematic of the battery again, right? You have anode, cathode, and what you can think of that is the anode as a, you know, rich lithium source, right? Some, something with a high lithium chemical potential, right? For example, lithium metal, okay? On the other side, the cathode, you can think of a lithium sink, right? You know, something with low lithium chemical potential. And what essentially happens at the interface of against your solid electrolyte is that, you know, this anode may potentially lithiate your, your, your solid electrolyte and cause reduction here. And on the other side, right, the cathode will, you know, potentially suck out your lithium and causing the oxidation of your solid electrolyte here. And we can all use this, you know, to, uh, to evaluate using the uh, thermodynamic scheme, right, that we just showed you before. Okay, so on the anode side, we actually find that taking this, uh, you know, famous LGPS, for example, we actually find that on the anode side, the LGPS actually would react, you know, is actually thermodynamically not stable, okay, at this uh, high lithium chemical potential of lithium metal. We actually find that it decomposes into this guy. This is the phase diagram, right, you know, lithium phosphide, lithium germanium alloy, right, and lithium sulfide. And if you just calculate the reaction energy, you can see that's actually a, a, a incredibly favorable reaction, right? Uh, you can see thousands of kilojoules per mole. And the same thing, you know, on the other side at the five volt end of the castle, you can also see the LGPS is not stable anymore and uh, it would like to decompose into sulfur, right? You know, PGS5 and germanium S2. Essentially, it's kind of like lithium, right? At this high voltage, it really want to get out of the material. And this reaction is also crazily, uh, you know, active, okay? So this is just from our uh, thermodynamic calculation. Uh, the reason, I think the big advantage of that, uh, you know, doing computation here is that when this new material just come out, right, there's actually no thermodynamic data really available, you know, so you really cannot do it, right, you know, either through your other source of database, right, but through computation because we can calculate the energy easily, you know, so we can pull out this uh, analysis very, very straightforwardly. So our calculation essentially shows that there's actually a strong thermodynamic driving force uh, for potential reaction to happen at the interface, right? So this is actually what we predict, you know, if you really want to lithium, use lithium metal, right? Uh, so, so here is some experiments also by, uh, by the Jürgen uh, <coughs> uh, Janik, a, a Germany group. Uh, because as you know, all these kind of like solid, solid battery the interface is very, very difficult to probe, right? Probe directly in experiments. So here what they do is they use the in situ XPS, you know, technique, right? So essentially they, they have this solid, I mean, uh, solid electrolyte surfaces, and then they deposit lithium metal on top of it. And in the meantime, they have a probe, right, to just observe what happens in situ uh, using XPS. And here's what they see, okay? So on the left here is the pristine sample, basically before you put lithium on there. Uh, and on the right, right, is the XPS spectra after lithiation. So you can see that, right, this is a germanium peak, right, you can see that after lithiation, the emergence of a new peak is the reduced lithium, okay, and lithium uh, uh, germanium metal and lithium germanium alloy, okay. And this is the phosphate peak, right, you can see after lithiation, it comes a peak of lithium phosphide. And here's the sulfur peak, you can see the emergence of a lithium sulfide peak, okay. So you can see that what they get in experiments agree with exactly what we see in computation, right? Is that when this thing is lithiated, they form lithium sulfide, lithium phosphide, and lithium germanium alloy, okay? So, and this can be a, a big problem, right? As we mentioned, if you have something formed at the interface there, right, they will form a interface, you know, a new phase, an interface layer, and this thing gonna grow, right? And leading to, you know, high interfacial resistance. Okay, so this is also their, uh, you know, impedance measurement, they can see that, you know, as time goes by, the resistance goes higher, okay, and the, the thickness of the, you know, interface layer uh, also grow, okay. So that's actually a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, big problem, you know, for lithium battery, uh, for solid state lithium battery. <coughs> Here what we want to see is that uh, we want to, uh, you know, look at another material, okay, which is this uh, lipon material, Okay, so lipon material is actually, uh, you know, is a nitrogen-doped uh, lithium phosphate. 
So this is actually a very well demonstrated solid electrolyte for thin film lithium battery, right? So for this solid electrolyte, uh, you know, people actually have demonstrated easily like their battery goes very high rate and easily like tens of thousands of cycles, right? Without very, very little degradation. So here we also want to understand why this solid electrolyte material, right? This is another one would work so well. But here from our uh, thermodynamic scheme, we actually also find, you know, it can actually react with lithium metal, right, and form these guys, right? You know, you can see essentially the lithium kind of reduce any element, you know, in this kind of material. But here come, right, uh, and this is actually also experimentally confirmed, right? So using the same in situ technique, right, below is a pristine sample, and above is a lithiated sample. You can see that, you know, after lithiation, the peak of lithium oxide, lithium nitride, and lithium phosphide, uh, uh, phosphide right, all emerge, right? So this is agree exactly with the prediction uh, from our thermodynamic calculation. So as uh, I mentioned, right, you, you know, Lipon actually works very, very well with lithium metal anode experiments. But here's why, you know, but why is that, right? You know, if they react in the same way as ALGPS, you know, but why this material would work? So if you look at this material, that formed here, okay? What we think is that when they react, happens they form some interfacial layers here, right? Such as the uh, lithium nitride, lithium phosphide, lithium oxide. And all these materials are actually electron insulated. So they actually block the electron coming through and only allow lithium ion going through, okay? As a result of that, this actually becomes some passivation layer, okay? They actually form something there and protect the solid electrolyte. And the very same thing would not happen in the LGPS material, right? Because what you formed in the LGPS have something like lithium germanium alloy, right, which is electronic conducting. So then the interface layer formed there then is not protective, right? It's not preservation. So as a result, you know, the reaction can just continue and actually degrade your, you know, entire solid electrolyte and grow a very thick, resistive interface. Okay? So that's as we think is what actually happens, you know. Uh, with this different material there, right? So uh, what is really important is that, right, you know, what interface you would form, okay? So with that, right, we can actually, you know, see like when you actually put different materials, right, with your lithium metal, you actually have several types of interface that you may form, right? First type is that your lithium metal is actually stable with a solid electrolyte. Okay, right, you don't have any thermodynamic reaction, right? You know, nothing formed there, like there's no interface. Or another thing is that you form the mixed ionic and electron conducting interface, right? For example, in the case of the LGPS, so then this is a bad case because they would actually continuous react, right, and, you know, give you very bad performance, right? This thing would not work. And another example is the Lipon interface, right, that you can actually form a stable SEI and essentially passivate the interface. So this is actually, you know, what the working case has shown so far, right? And if on the case of the left side, actually from our calculation, we see that essentially seems like, you know, not many material can intrinsically stable with the lithium metal. So we think like this may be actually a good case, okay, for battery application. So here what we do is that we try to find out, right, whether there's some material out there that are really thermodynamically stable, okay, against the lithium metal, right? So you won't form any interface as you have here, okay? So here what we do is that we, uh, you know, we basically explore all these ternary compounds, okay? Uh, you know, like uh, fluoride, sulfide, oxide, right? So this is the cation, what they, what they have. And this is the cathodic limit, right? Means that the voltage, the thing got reduced, okay? So basically zero means it's lithium metal, right? Uh, so here, let's first look at all these oxide. Then you can see actually most oxide, right, up here, right, means that it will be reduced by lithium metal, okay? And a few of them seems like are stable. And the reaction basically is shown as this, right? Basically lithium kind of like, re you know, form lithium oxide and lithium metal uh, alloy. And same thing goes for sulfide, okay? And also for fluoride, right? You know, basically it seems like lithium, right, is really so reducing, they can really reducing anything out there. And what we, so, you know, so actually people, you know, already thought like, you know, probably you can only use binary, right, to protect the lithium, you know, because all these ternary is gonna be reduced by lithium. But here we actually find something that's very new and very interesting is that if you see uh, nitride, actually a lot of them are below here, means that they actually are stable against the lithium metal, okay? So this is actually a very interesting uh, finding. Essentially it tells you that actually nitride 
has very unique thermodynamic stability against nuclear metal. So then this actually, you know, significantly broaden your materials choice, right? If you actually want to intrinsically protect against nuclear metal. Okay. So this is also one suggestion, right? We, we you know, discover you find from our computation. And here actually I will maybe just quickly go through, you know, uh, what we have at the cathode interface, okay? You know, as a cathode we shown, right, you actually have a, a lithium transition metal oxide, right? For example, like this guy, lithium cobalt oxide here. So then reaction with the solid electrolyte can be much more complicated, right? You can see you have a quaternary compound here, right? You have, a, you know, some transition metal oxide here, right? So what happens between them, right? They may, you know, chemically react or they may electrochemically react, right? Means like they react under certain voltage. Uh, so, you know, we can still evaluate this using the thermodynamic scheme, you know, that we have. Essentially, how we can do is that we can put these two materials together, right, with certain ratio, and then see whether they form some combination of phases that actually have lower energy, right? If they form some combination of phases that have a lower energy, right, this means that they are thermodynamically favorable, okay, to react and to turn into something else, okay? And that basically tells you this is, uh, you know, a chemical stability issue there, right? And if this reaction happens at a driven of certain voltage, okay, that means that, you know, it's have an electrochemical stability issue. Uh, so we just actually did, you know, uh, LGPS and lithium cobalt oxide. We indeed find that, right, through the reaction, they want to form these guys, okay? And this is a reaction energy. Actually, that's a pretty favorable reaction, right? We scale it by EV per atom, but if you scale it back to kilojoule per mole of molecule, it's actually also an incredible amount of energy. So this suggests that there are highly favorable reaction, right, between the solid electron and the cathode material. So this is also confirmed experimentally, right, as you can see that when they put this together, right, they form a, you know, a new phase interface layer down there, okay. So what it tells us is that, right, this actually also gonna be a potential problem for solid state battery, right, because once they react, they kind of form some thick interface layers, okay, and this thing, you know, because these things are not as lithium conductive as the LGPS, so then you will give you very high interfacial resistance. Then how can you address this problem, right? You know, because your material selection is actually so limited here, right? You know, I mean, you don't actually have many solid electrolyte, good solid electrolyte, and you don't have any, many that good electron material, right? You're pretty limited by your material choice. If they put them together, it does not work, then what are you gonna do? Okay, so here we find that, you know, and this is actually people already kind of like figure out experimentally before, is that, right, to resolve this, you can actually apply a coating layer in the middle, right? If you put a coating layer, right, you sort of like, you know, separate this material, and then what you need to make sure is your coating layer actually works with the ca cathode, and also your coating layer, right, works with the solid electrolyte. And this we also uh, done through that, uh, through computation, okay? Uh, you know, so probably that's uh, very technical, maybe I won't explain that, but uh, in too much detail, right? But this, we calculate some like a commonly demonstrate coating material. And at first we, we find that, you know, this coating material have the right electrochemical window, right? What it means is that, is that be, you know, during the normal voltage of a battery, all this material itself actually is stable against that, you know, voltage. And we also find they actually form good interface, you know, between electrode right, and also cathode, okay, and uh, this is some uh, experimental confirmation, right, so this is the uh, impedance, so when you have like really uncoated material, uh, uncoated interface, you can see it has a very high interfacial resistance, but once you, you apply even a few nanometer of coating, you can see the interfacial resistance drops significantly, right, uh, so, you know, it's really demonstrating uh, the effectiveness uh, of that, okay. Uh, Right, so, so here I just use these slides to summarize the interface talk. Basically what we show is that through this fundamental thermodynamic calculation, we see that solid electron material, right, that actually all have limited electrochemical window. And a result of that, when you actually really put them into battery, right, they would actually react with anode and also react with cathode. And actually form some interface layer, you know, in between, right, uh, between this electrolyte and electrode, okay? And this, what you form there, gonna be have a very significant impact on your battery performance. 
And what we uh, propose, right, and what we find that is you can actually, uh, through the wide selection of the material, right, you can actually have some material that's compatible, right, that forms a favorable interface, right? For example, in the case of lipon with lithium metal, or another way is that you can apply a coating layer, right, to essentially resolve the interfacial reaction issue there, okay? So, uh, so okay, so with that, uh, I would like to conclude my talk. So essentially, we demonstrate the computation techniques, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, based on this materials database, right, to actually, uh, you know, discover and design new materials. So there are a number of techniques demonstrated here, right? One is actually really calculate the interfacial equilibrium with solid material, right? And we, you know, and it seems like what we calculate here agree with all the experiments out there, right? And this technique is actually very accessible and, you know, it's uh, very transferable to other type of interface, okay? And we also demonstrate the ab initial molecular dynamic simulation by right, calculating ionic conductivity. Uh, and, you know, through these techniques we design, you know, we sort of understand, right, what really happens with this fast ion conductor. And, you know, we, you know, demonstrate also, like, how we can predict the new materials, right, which also later verified by experiments, and through that also propose new design principles. And uh, through our interfacial studying, uh, we also provide, you know, significant understanding, right, into, like, why the interface are not so good, right, for some of the materials and you know, how you use interfacial engineering, which is a key to improve the battery performance. So with that, I would like to thank my group and collaborator and the funding support, also uh, superionic, uh, I mean, sorry, supercomputing resources, and uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer uh, your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Any question? So, so I have a question. So and can you comment on, you know, the advantages of having a magnesium-based uh, battery? Okay, so, uh, yeah, the disadvantage is that it doesn't work, right, <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, so basically I think the, the logic is this, right? So, um, uh, you know, if you look at the, the pic, you know, diagram we show, basically because lithium is a one-charge ion, right? So when you actually uh, cycle lithium, it only gets you, right, it only gets you one electron per lithium, right? So if you use magnesium, you actually can get two electron per magnesium, right? So that's actually one of the big arguments, right? You actually essentially get more capacity, right? Uh, so, right, you get more capacity, right? But I guess the thing is that, uh, you know, lithium usually gives you higher voltage, right? Magnesium will give you lower voltage, right? So that's a big sacrifice there. But I think the biggest uh, motivation for magnesium is still that uh, the anode, right? So, you know, basically people argue that if you use magnesium, you can use magnesium metal as the anode, right? So as long as you go metal, you essentially save a, you know, big volume down here, okay? Right, so that's, I guess, the biggest advantage. This advantage, right, as I said, it basically doesn't work, right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, basically the, the thing is that, uh, you know, here, right, you have a cathode material, you know, which is this uh, lithium uh, transition metal oxide, right? So as I show, you know, lithium actually has to go in and outside this material easily, right? So this has to be a good uh, ion conductor. But basically magnesium, because it's too charged, it actually does not like to move. You know, so basically, you know, most of the material people try it does not move around, right? So basically they don't want to get out, right? And uh, there's also some problem with, you know, electrolyte and also anode. So I guess it's uh, it's pretty challenging, yeah. Okay. Um, what kind of defect caused the basic to Oh, you mean the commercial ones? Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, it's complicated in the sense that uh, anything fails, right? Would you know? I like, say there are so many things can fail, and anything that fail, right, will actually give you a problem, right? So for example, I would say, you know, one example is that in this electrode material, so here is a simplified di uh, diagram, but in like real material, basically, uh, you know, you have this material, right, it's kind of like a particle, right? So then you actually have to sort of, uh, you know, coat it with like, uh, I mean, depends on your material, right? Basically, you kind of like make it a composite, right, you know, in the electrode. So over the time, right, it's one thing is that this kind of particle may break off, you know, 
like break off from the electrode, right? So then it does not either does not get lithium or does not get electron from the electrode, right? So that becomes dead, you know, dead material, right? Right. So then you know that's one of the mechanism, okay? And the second is that you know you may actually have some side reaction, right? So as we shown here, right in solid state battery, as you know, like it's very favorable to have reaction, you know, here and here, right, between electrolyte and electrode. So in the uh, real commercial electrode, actually the same thing also happens. You know, so I'm not sure, like, you know, like, for example, in the earliest generation of lithium leaf, right, uh, if they are in states like Arizona, right, which is super hot, they actually battery life dies very quickly, you know, like in two years. That's basically it's too hot, so the reaction is kind of like accelerated, you know. So then there are actually kind of some lawsuit there, right. So I, I, as I said, right, anything fail will give you a failure. You know, there are actually so many things can go around there. It's a fairly complicated system, you know, in that case. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, right, yeah. So, yeah, so what we did here, basically, the substitution are right, fairly straightforward uh, substitution. It's kind of like everybody probably would think about it, right? So, I mean, in principle, we can do more complicated ones. So, we basically, I didn't show it, but in some of other study, uh, so there actually, it's a uh, Gersidius work. He sort of did some data mining and figure out what substitution is more likely, right? And then you can actually, you know, kind of like more efficiently explore more substitution, right? Uh, but uh, indeed, but uh, technically how we do that, right, so basically we put that beam and we sort of, right, we, we, we have to statically relax the structure, right? Otherwise, you know, if it's too distorted, like the energy gap wouldn't make sense. And we also have, I th and I think another critical problem in here is that, uh, you know, a technical problem is that if you look at this, right, uh, you know, uh, this is actually have a lot of partial occupancy. You can see the lithium, right, is actually have a wide proportion there, right? Basically means that, you know, they only feel a fraction of that. So you actually also need to alter the structure again, right, to make sure, like, you get a low energy configuration. Oh, yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so basically our idea is that we want to, uh, right. Yeah, so basically we want to sort of uh, keep it relatively close to this structure in the sense that we probably, you know, I think probably is this structure kind of like make it its transport so fast, right? Does that make sense? But we actually also evaluate, right? Basically through this, we actually also evaluate what the other phase they would form, you know? So basically, right, when you got, like, for example, this energy, right, this is basically the energy, let's say, from oxygen one to the comparative low energy phase, you know. So basically, let's say if you substitute into oxygen, right, essentially what you form is a lithium four state, okay, lithium three PO four, and here is a lithium, you know, germanium O four, right. Especially the lithium four state is actually very, very stable. So basically, why the oxygen does not work is essentially they want to go to lithium three O four space, right? Lithium three PO four, which is very, very stable. Okay? Yeah. Uh right, yeah. So usually it's the faster the charging, you know, the the short the shorten the life, right? You know, that's kind of a generally what do we know, right? Uh, uh huh. Right. Essentially, is that uh, okay? I think it's kind of. I, I would probably just give you some intuition, right? So if you okay, so this is charging, right? So if you look at charge, oops, is essentially lithium moves out and uh, inserted back there, right? So you know, so basically you apply a charge here, right? So you oops, sorry about that. I'm sorry what I did. So essentially, you know is that your, your applied charge, right, kind of like gives you energy, right, because 
you know, right? If lithium has low energy here and high energy here, right? Gives the thermodynamic energy, but you also give pay a little bit of premium, right? Which is the kinetics, right? You know, to to help the rate, right? Okay. So basically, the faster charger you have, is that you basically want to move this lithium faster, right? You kind of like pay a more premium, right? In the exchange to move them faster. But then the problem is that like uh, the you know the more you know additional voltage you apply. Uh, the other side of reaction may possibly happen, right? You're actually driving those things, you know? Is that, right? Does that make sense? So I would say that's probably the, you know, kind of like uh, high level intuition uh, that would have. Essentially is that like the lithium does not like to move around, right, as fast as, as you want it, right? So, you know, and you are kind of like driving some other processes in the meanwhile. Oh, you mean which one is easier, or? Uh, I would say it's really materials dependent, okay, right, but, uh, uh, but I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think right now seems like it's more cathode is limiting, yeah. It's kinda, uh, especially those high energy cathodes, right, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Because on the left here is actually carbon, right, it seems like they, they hold up their structure pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it's a actually a very good question, right? So, uh, so right, so right, so this is essentially kind of like the key problem, of right of the let's say, the entire objective of why you want to figure out right the superionic conductor, right? So, so there are a number of things. I think like, uh, basically, what I shown here is that you you want basically what I shown is that for the concerted migration, you basically want to have a lithium sitting high energy and one and low, right, and they move together, then the barrier is lower, right, if you have their reaction, you know, have some interaction among them, right? So certainly, uh, that's the mechanism we, we illustrated, okay? And, uh, uh, <coughs> right, and, uh, and another thing you will mention is that a uh, cooling interaction, right? So basically, we also calculate like the different strengths of the interaction, you know, it also have some effect of that, okay? Uh, and there's another effect is that uh, I didn't mention, is that actually uh, for LGPS, let's see. Um, for LGPS, it's actually uh, the, uh, the sulfur, yeah, I'm not actually sure you can see this, but this yellow one is a sulfur, right? So basically, the idea is that it's another paper, is that li like this sulfur has to be in the geometry of BCC lattice. Like when it's in the BCC lattice, what will happen is that for this lithium, they're sitting on the tetrahedral side, right, with like four sulfur. And in the BCC, basically, they all sitting on the tetrahedral side and from tetrahedral to tetrahedral, the energy is actually very, very low. So, right, so that's uh, another, right, constraint in terms of the coordination, you know. So, right, so certainly then, that, that paper already did it, is basically they tr then try to find like all these material in the BCC, find, you know, uh, right, anion lattice, and the lithium is right at the tetral side, right? But you still need some cation to hold up together, okay? So, yeah. right, so, so that's actually one of the uh, reasons, but uh, basically our com contribution is that, like, basically tells you, right, if you have a BCC, it's great, right? But if you don't have a BCC, you know, you can still probably insert the lithium into your high energy side, right, to activate this mechanism to lower your barrier, okay? Right, so, 